Welcome to module four, topic two, which is going to be about substantive testing. Now in our previous module, we looked at testing internal controls. Now we're gonna look at gathering substantive evidence, all to help us form an opinion about whether the financial statements are free from material misstatement. So what exactly are we going to cover in this topic? Well, we're going to look at when and why we need to gather substantive evidence. We're gonna look at the types of substantive procedures that we can actually use how we design those substantive procedures, remembering our four rules that we've already learnt before. We're gonna look at sampling issues related to substantive testing. We're gonna look at executing substantive tests and then also evaluating substantive test results and making conclusions. So let's draw our context diagram. We know that so far, the thing that we're going to produce is our audit report. And our audit report is really our opinion about whether the financial statements are free from material misstatements. So we need to gather evidence about whether that information is true and fair. And realistically, what we're saying there is we're saying, does it meet the assertions? And we know that we have different types of assertions. We have our assertions for transactions, and we have our assertions for balances. And feeding into that evidence is also our need for materiality, because we need to identify what are the material misstatements, not just misstatements in general. We also know that in collecting our evidence, we need to consider sampling. So we're not going to be able to test every transaction, not with the technology and the tools that we currently have, so we need to sample. Now the big question is, how exactly do I go about collecting that evidence? And we know that we need to have our audit strategy, and our audit strategy guides us to do one of three main strategies, relying on tests of controls or a controls-based approach. We know that there's the possibility also to do substantive procedures, or that you have some mix of the two of those different approaches. Now thinking back, how do we do design our audit strategy? Well, that all comes from our audit risk model. Oops, I made a mistake there, let me fix that. DR equals AR over IR times CR. And we can only do that model once we have, I'm running out of space here, an understanding of the client. Understand the client. Oh, this is gonna be really tight. All right. So understanding the client helps us figure out what our audit strategy should be. It also is going to help us determine what evidence. So in module one, or sorry, in topic one, what we did um, when it came to topic one was, let me get my pointer up, we looked at tests of internal controls. Today what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at substantive procedures. And we know that to be able to design those substantive procedures, we need to know the general nine audit procedures that we have, okay? Um, and those nine procedures feed into both substantive and control tests. We're gonna to need to figure out what is happening at the client so that we can design those nine procedures to help us get evidence that is going to be sufficient and appropriate as ASA 500 actually requires us to do. And remember, this is, uh, you know, I talked about design last week um, or in our last topic. This is really about that craft of designing. It's not necessarily a mathematical structured science that we're going to be looking at here. So when and why do we need to go out and gather substantive evidence? Well, inside our client, here's what it looks like. Over on the right hand side, and let me get my mouse pointer up so that you can see it here. Where's the laser pointer? Here we go. So in the accounting systems, you have your accounting records, right? So when I say accounting records, 
These are going to be our journals, our ledgers, all of the information that's kept within some sort of AIS, which is Accounting Information System. Now, that Accounting Information System might also be part of a larger enterprise-wide information system. So it might not just be accounting, it might be accounting linked in with production or marketing um, in, a, in a wider system. There's going to be some portion that does the journal entries, that has the ledgers like we've learned in our basic intro accounting. Now on the right hand side, you'll see that what we also have is source documents. So source documents are really about the original documents that go with a transaction and thinking about back to paper-based days of businesses, you, know, you might have a little order book where customers, you write down their orders, um, you rip out a copy, you give it to a customer as the receipt and the other part, a, a duplicate part serves as your records that will then go to the accountant for the accounting um, for them to do the journal entries. So those source documents are typically in systems that are linked to the accounting information system, but those could include things like, whoops, let me get my pen working here, something that holds orders. It could be your HR system that does timesheets. It could be your invoicing system. Um, it could be something to do with your warehouse. Okay, so, so the source documents, it could even be something like a bank statement. For a client. So our source documents are every other potential to a type of document that the company uses to track its business, keep records that is not our journal entries. And so you'll see in, uh, let me get my pointer back up here, there are two things that we need to do. Number one, we need to make sure that what's in the source documents is all included in the accounting records and that everything that is in the accounting records is also backed up by real source documents. So you think here going backwards, is everything in our accounting records really in our source documents? And you'll notice there that it says the assertion of existence and occurrence. And that's really important. We want to make sure that everything exists. The other side that you'll see from source documents to accounting records, where's my little mouse here? I lost my mouse. Let me change the color. If everything in our source documents is recorded in our accounting records, then that's going to be the completeness assertion. Now, of course, we have other assertions around here. We want to make sure that regardless of you know, everything that exists and that is completely recorded is recorded at the right value, in the right accounting period, using the right journal entries. But this is the crux of what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure that everything that's in the books really did happen and everything that we recorded in our original documentation has been recorded in the accounting. When do we actually think about gathering our substantive evidence? Well, there's three things we need to think about. Is there a risk of material misstatement? Um, we're going to gather evidence on most of our risks, especially we're going to focus on those ones that are significant, but things at a lower level as well, we're still going to need to investigate in our audit. So where we think there's a risk of material misstatement, we need to gather substantive evidence. Where there is a specific control weakness, remember control weakness actually helps us narrow down exactly where we might find a misstatement and where there's greater inherent risk. Now these two are sort of linked to each other because of course where there's greater inherent risk you're potentially going to have a ROM and if it's big enough you may have also a significant risk. Now we do this task typically after we've tested internal controls. So sometimes if this is an audit that you've done before, you might test internal controls and substantive testing at the same time. But on a new client, you'll typically test the internal controls first because once we've tested internal controls, if the controls look good, we've confirmed control risk, we can, as low or medium, we can continue with less levels of substantive testing. However, if we've tested internal controls and they're very poor, then we know that we're going to have to increase our control risk, decrease our detection risk, and shift to a much larger volume of substantive testing. So we may have to rejig our approach somewhat.
So what are the different types of substantive procedures? Right now we've just talked about the nine, where's my nine, <laughs> nine fingers, uh, nine procedures um, that apply everywhere. But I'm gonna actually break some of those procedures down into three main types. Now, first off, remember last, uh, in our last module, we tested internal controls. It's really important, and I also have another video about, can you determine the difference between control tests and substantive tests? I really recommend that you watch that particular additional video. But control tests are about evidence that controls are operating effectively. Is there an authorization? Is a check happening? Is something that's meant to happen automatically working? What is different about substantive tests is that substantive tests are procedures performed on specific transactions and balances. We're trying to find dollar misstatements. So in the control test, a control test is not going to tell us, oh, yet we have exactly $125,000 worth of error. We're only going to be able to gather that information from substantive tests. So even if I find a control weakness, a control weakness might say, oh, narrow your search down to this particular part, this month of the year, when this person was doing transactions, but it's not going to be able to easily generate for us the exact dollar amount. So that's the main difference. Um, you can see there in the third point that I've got, the main difference between tests uh, is that control testing does not directly measure dollar error in the accounting records. Okay, so at this particular topic, we're looking at can we find that dollar value misstatement so that we can take it to management and say, oh, well, look, you say sales is this dollar amount, we think sales is this dollar amount, and here's our evidence that shows you exactly why there's all of these errors in this particular gap. Clients are not gonna make changes unless we can provide them with really strong evidence. I'll say, oh, that's just your opinion. How did you create that estimate? So we need to be really sure when we're gathering this evidence. So I mentioned that we have different types of audit procedures. So remember that, I'm just gonna write these in a different colored pen here. These are the nine procedures that we've got. All right, we'll talk about the nine a little bit later in the topic. And I can use any of those nine to design tests of internal controls, all right, which we've already looked at, or we can do substantive procedures. Now, substantive procedures fall into a couple of different categories. Number one, there's substantive analytical procedures. Right now, all we've done is that general ratio analysis and trend analysis. That is just to help us at the planning stage. We can actually use analytical procedures at the detailed testing stage to help us gather evidence. Um, when, we're going to, when are we going to use substantive analytical procedures? Usually on smaller accounts, all right? Um, often on accounts that have lower number of transactions. Or, let me just put little bullet points in here, or when transactions are all the same. All right, so if the transaction is the same over and over and over again and there's no variation, then you might have a better chance um, using the substantive analytical procedure. But it's not usually going to be the only thing you do. Remember when we used analytics at the planning stage, they can't tell us exactly what's wrong, but they can help us hypothesize. Well, when we're doing substantive testing, the substantive analytical procedure is sort of like radar, right? We can use something like inventory turnover. So an example is going to be inventory turnover. And low inventory turnover in most businesses helps us identify obsolete or slow moving stock. Now, until I actually look at that individual item, I can't go, yep, this is definitely slow moving or no, it's not. But again, it helps me narrow down the field. Like identifying control weaknesses, these substantive analytics help us narrow things down so that we can know where to look more efficiently. So think about it as an efficiency tool. Now the next one that we have is tests of detail. And it's really, you know, the name gives it away there, details of transactions. Um, and so you're gonna look at test of a balance, test of transactions, or test of disclosures. Now typically our tests of disclosures relate to making sure that we're following the AASBs or that we're following our IFRA standards. Okay, so is everything laid out in accordance with the standard? 
these tests of disclosures are things that we normally do at the very end because we need to make sure that the client has written all of their note disclosures and we've gone through them with our main audit evidence. So we don't, won't do tests of disclosures until the very end. Now, when it comes to balances and transactions, here is where it gets a little bit tricky. We know that we have different assertions for balances and transactions, but think about accounts receivable. Accounts receivable is one sort of major ledger made up of a lot of smaller accounts of different customers. So you've got customer A, customer B, customer C here. And then, for example, with customer B, that person might have a certain number of transactions during the period. So when we're testing accounts receivable, I actually need to test the balance. The whole balance does everything add up inside accounts receivable. And I also may need to do some individual tests of transactions. Now, that might sound like we're doubling our work, but we're actually not. What happens is that when I test sales, I'm testing a debit and a credit. I'm testing a debit to accounts receivable and I'm testing a credit to sale. So when I'm testing the credit side, all of the individual transactions, that information that I'm gathering just here actually helps me test the transactions for the accounts receivable balance that this feeds into. Now, when you're designing your tests, do you need to have a test of balance, a test of transaction, a test of disclosure, a substantive analytic? Um, in practice, we need to make sure that we have good coverage over all of these tests. But for students in this particular course, I'm saying all I want you to worry about is know the assertions and have one test for every assertion. That test might be a test of balance. It might be a test of transaction. It might be a disclosure test. It might be an analytic. But I want you to pick the best test that suits that particular assertion. Don't think that you need to have one of each. Just focus on making sure that you can test each individual assertion. And we're going to talk about how we do that a little bit later on in this topic. So that's just more information about the three types of substantive tests. I've already talked about this. So I mentioned before, which is the best procedure? As I just said, the key thing here is to think about the assertions, all right? And you need to have one test per assertion, at least. Now, some assertions might be at greater risk than others. We're gonna talk about the, in that some examples, but I can't, it's not a good idea. I, I guess I need to clarify that there. In ASA 500, it doesn't say that you must test every single assertion. But it makes sense that if you're going to gather evidence on whether um, sales, for example, is appropriate and is free from material misstatement, then you would imagine in that situation, you do want to make sure that they all did happen, recorded at the correct amount. Everything is recorded in the correct period using the correct journal entry. It doesn't make sense to me to actually go and do tests and leave off an assertion because then you haven't got the full picture of what's happening. So at least one test per assertion is what you should be aiming for in any one of these three or four categories. So what do I have to do? In my role, I have to perform audit procedures and collect sufficient appropriate evidence for each account and each assertion. Now remember that sufficient let me just change the color of my pen here. So sufficient evidence is about making sure that we have enough. So that's where making sure that we have the right sample size is really important. Appropriate means that we're using the right procedures to actually check for that specific account and that specific assertion. If I said to you, let's test that inventory really exists, but let's do it by talking to somebody rather than looking at the inventory itself. It's not an appropriate test for that particular assertion and our particular need. Now, it's important to note that for account balances or transactions, there are different assertions at higher risk of misstatement. So they're not all equally at risk. So I wouldn't take any transaction account and say, I'm going to split my time between my five assertions equally. I'm going to spend more time where I think there is more risk. And that's dependent on the client. It's dependent on the um, circumstances as well. 
So I mentioned before in COVID-19 times, we might have some companies that are trying to understate their revenues to qualify for the JobKeeper program or for other government assistance. Um, in other times, if a company is trying to ward off uh, perhaps a hostile takeover, again, they'll try and understate their assets to make themselves look more, to make themselves look less attractive. But if you're trying to IPO and list on the stock exchange, you're going to try and overstate your assets and your revenues and understate your expenses and liabilities to make yourself look like a more attractive prospect. So it's not as simple as saying, oh yeah, for sales we're always worried about occurrence, or for this account we're always worried about this assertion. Understanding the context is really critical. And this becomes really important in exams too, that you use information that comes in a context or in a case to be able to make the decision of what assertion is most important and what should I do. So now let's get on to designing our substantive procedures. And I'm gonna give you some examples here to talk about you know, where there's more risk um, and how we can use our nine procedures. If you think back to my video about fried rice, it's all about understanding the context and then customizing it to what you need and what you have available at the time. So a reminder of the nine procedures um, that we've already talked about before, but you know, if you forget these nine, always have the nine written down somewhere. There's inspection. And remember that we can inspect physical assets as well as looking at documents, so looking at things. Observing, which is typically us watching someone else do a task. An external confirmation, which is when we are confirming with a third party, typically in writing. So if you're doing this over the phone, that's not going to be sufficient evidence. It needs to be in writing. We've got recalculation, redoing the mathematics. Reperformance, which is redoing a task that the client has done. Analytical procedures, which is using our understanding of the accounting to look at trends and segment data to do some analysis. Inquiry, which is talking to people. Vouching, which is starting at the end and working backwards, and tracing, which is starting at the beginning and moving forwards. So a reminder of what we talked about before, we have our accounting records and our source documents. For transactions, we can go forward in time to check completeness. For our accounting records, we want to make sure you know anybody could potentially create a journal entry. There could be some control weaknesses there. So for every journal entry, does it match back to a real original transaction? So how do we decide what procedure to use? Well, number one, we have to think about what is the account and what is the assertion. Let me add some information in there, that's a bit wrong. So we have to think about what account and assertion that we're testing. We also need to consider what are the circumstances for that particular client so that we can figure out what assertion is at greatest risk. Then I need to figure out the nature, timing and extent of audit procedures. Nature is what is the procedure I'm going to use? Am I going to use vouching? Am I going to use tracing? Am I going to use recalculating? Timing is going to be when do I need to do it? Some things are time specific. So something like evaluating inventory. Does inventory exist? We need to do that close to the end of the financial period, not two months before or two months after. And then the extent is going to be how much evidence which is going to relate to our sampling. Now in this course, we are not going to ask you to actually calculate sample sizes. Most firms will have their own software that helps you do that. We're just gonna talk about which method to use. Okay, now let's look at some examples of substantive procedures for different areas. And I'm gonna start with so the first question we always have to ask ourselves is, what assertions are at higher risk of material misstatement? And when it comes here to sales, most of the time, and especially in instances where a company needs finance, where the economy is not doing so well, that occurrence is likely to be an assertion that's at higher risk. The other one that we also always need to worry about, especially is accuracy. Uh, because we want to make sure that sales are accurately recorded. Most of the time when there is fraud around sales, it's usually creating fake sales rather than taking existing sales for customers and trying to bump up the amounts that are included. 
For transactions that happen over long periods of time, cutoff becomes an issue um, with things that have manual journal entries, then classification, as long as if people aren't always great at doing their um, journal entries, could be an issue as well. So let me build some different procedures for each of these different areas. Now when it comes to occurrence, we know that, and I'm going to follow my four rules here, remember, uh, making sure that we have the correct um, name of the procedure, the client information in enough detail and it's fit for purpose. So I'm going to start my occurrence one with vouching. So I'm going to vouch a sample Okay, so what I have here is voucher sample of sales journals to shipping confirmations and customer orders. And I can already see that I've made a mistake here because when I put the sample in, I didn't say what type of sample. So I'm going to say here a haphazard sample of sales journals. So I've used the right technical name. I said vouching. I'm going to go work backwards because if I can find a sales journal but I can't find proof of a delivery to the customer or the customer order, then that sale really did not occur. So let's try one now for completeness. So a process normally would be, you know, the customer has an order, um, it has to be shipped to the customer, we maybe have an invoice or a receipt, um, and then our journal entry. So in this instance, with completeness, remember we're going to use the tracing procedure. It's starting at the beginning and working forward. So I'm going to write that out right now. Now in this one here, I've said trace a haphazard sample of customer orders to delivery confirmations, invoices, and journal entries. Now, I don't know whether there are invoices, but realistically, if there are you know, six documents in the chain, you want to try and look at all six of those, or maybe some of the key points. With completeness, you might also consider as well looking at not just the journal entries, but the cash receipt process as well, making sure that that cash was received. That's also a proof, um, if you're thinking of another test for occurrence, if there's a sale, was there cash received as well at the same time? Now, when it comes to accuracy, we want to do some form of check of the mathematics because remember, accuracy is about the dollars. So I'm going to go with recalculation here. Let me write that out for you. All right, so here for recalculation, I've got recalculate um, a random sample of sales invoices, check the price to the master price list and the quantity to the customer order. Now, in reality, we probably do a whole lot of these things at the same time. Like when I'm vouching, I select my sample of gel sales journals, I've got shipping confirmations, I've got customer orders, I might have invoices. At that same time, I would use that same sample to do this recalculation test. The same with the tracing. I would take those customer orders, follow them through. When I'm testing, um, and I realize here that, you know, one of the things that we also need to do is, it's not just does the document exist. The other thing that I need to check is that I want to check that the quantities are correct in both of these instances as well. So I want to make sure that, yes, it's the right item, it's the right quantity, all of that has flowed forward. So a lot of the times these are combined, so I might write five tests, but I'm probably really only collecting a couple of samples of evidence and I'm doing the same tests or all of the tests on the same samples. Now the next uh, assertion is the cutoff assertion right here. I'm going to do that one in purple. Remember cutoff is, is the transaction recorded in the correct financial period? Now, when it comes to cutoff, it's no point in testing the entire year when it comes to cutoff. Instead, we want to test around the end of the financial period. So here, I'm going to say,
So here for cutoff, I've said select a sample, and I should add here from the journal one week before and after the end of the financial year. Check all of the dates on the journal entries that match the delivery dates. So if you delivered it on the 30th of June, it should be recorded in a journal on the 30th of June. But if it was delivered on the 30th of June and not recorded until the 1st of July, then we have a cutoff error. You might find that companies do the opposite. They actually record it this financial year, but then when you try and find the delivery dates, it's actually next financial year. That's a really common form of manipulation to try and uh, push sales into a period, depending on whether you've met a bonus or are trying to meet a bonus. So a cutoff test, and sometimes in some textbooks, you'll actually just see this say, do a cutoff test on sales. But here I'm saying, well, the cutoff test is looking at those journals and making sure that the journal entry is made in the period that matches the delivery date. Now, the next one we have is classification. And remember, classification is about my journal. Am I debiting it? Am I crediting it in the right place? So what we will do is with classification, I'm going to sort of connect that to my, tr my completeness tracing exercise. So I'll say here, while... So in this one, we say while tracing, check that the journal entries use the correct accounts based on the chart of accounts. Now the chart of accounts is a full list of all of the accounts that you can debit and credit. And it's not just sales, it'll be like sales for a particular product or there'll be some sort of code scheme to the chart of accounts. When it comes to checking the presentation assertion, we're really making sure that everything complies with the AASVs or the IFRS requirements. So here what you're going to do is you're likely going to be looking at documents. So I've written there, inspect the notes to the accounts and ensure that disclosures meet the requirements of the relevant AASB. Now you will notice that this is probably going to be the same presentation um, and disclosure test for all um, of your accounts because that's really what you're doing. You're checking that the notes match up with what is required in the AASB. So if I ever asked you to design audit procedures, the ones that I'm most interested in asking you to do, oh, that's not a very good, easy color for you to see there, switch that to red, is those five, occurrence, completeness, accuracy, cutoff, and classification, and only presentation if I ask you for it, because it's pretty much the same no matter what you do. So now let's look at an example with accounts receivable. That's a natural extension of looking at sales, um, especially for wholesale organizations, they'll be selling on credit, um, and we'll be looking at accounts receivable. Now, You'll notice here in my table that on the left hand side, I have different assertions because remember this is a balance. And even though it's made of transactions, we're mostly looking at the balance aspect of it. So we have to think for ourselves, what is the assertions that are at highest risk of material misstatement? Well, if you've already proven that your sales really did occur, then there's probably low risk around existence. But the biggest risk tends to be around accuracy, valuation, and allocation, which is, can we collect all of the money that our customers owe us? And that's because we have the potential for bad debts, people that just don't end up paying. So how are we gonna test each of these assertions? Well, number one, when it comes to existence is, how do we prove that the customer really does exist? Now you could do that through confirming that the sales really did occur, but one other common thing to do is something called confirmation um, of accounts receivable, or sometimes it's called a, the alternative is a receivables 
confirmation. All right. So we would send a confirmation of accounts receivable to not all of our accounts receivable, but probably a stratified sample with focus on the largest customers. Why look at largest customers? Well, largest customers also are much more likely to have big accounting departments and are be able to actually respond to your query. So you're going to send a confirmation to them and say, can you please tell us how much you owe us? So this confirmation is also going to partly help us a little bit down here with accuracy, evaluation and allocation. And this comes out of, I'm pretty sure it's ASA 505. I hope that's right, uh, when it comes to confirmations. Now, confirmation, we know about external confirmations is writing to someone. You could write to a bank. You could write to the tax office. Um, you can write to accounts receivable holders, which is what we're doing here. That's a good way to test the existence, but it's a really average test for accuracy, valuation, and allocation. That test only will tell us if we have overstated Test only. And here's why. Because imagine you write to the customers of the uh, client and you say, hey, um, we know that they owe 500000 If you say to them, oh, look, you know, do you owe 500000 And they say, oh, no, I owe 450 They will tell you if we have uh, the client has overstated their accounts receivable. However, if you write to the client and say, hey, you know, we think you owe 400 when in fact they owe 500,000, they're unlikely to tell you, oh, actually I owe more money. So if we've understated the accounts receivable, confirmation's not a really a great option. The other issue with confirmations, and these are traditionally done in most audits. Um, and when I asked, um, when I had to do a process of confirmation, you know, you get your list, you send out the letters, you have to include a reply paid envelope, you will wait for two weeks, you'll get some responses, if you don't get responses, you send another letter. Like the process of confirmations by hand manually with postal letters can be six weeks. You could try doing it via email as long as you can be sure that the person on the other end is the right person that you're sending it to. But rates of response, the number of people that reply to a confirmation is really, really low. And it proves that the customer does exist, but it isn't, as I mentioned before, a great test for the um, actual amount. A lot of people can't even tell you how much they owe somebody. So the other thing that I would suggest um, for existence is to do a, so the other way to test for the existence of an accounts receivable is actually to check whether the customer has paid after the end of the financial year. Because remember, these are people who owe money at the end of the financial year, and they probably got anywhere between 30 to 60 days to pay. So th what we would say there, and I'm going to add this in orange just above the line here, is that we would test a sample of accounts receivable and check bank statements for payments in the next financial year. So if six to eight weeks after we have a proof of a payment, that payment matches from that customer, the amount is the same, then we've got a test for existence and a test for accuracy, valuation and allocation without having to go and get other information. We're already going to be gathering this evidence, you know, in the two to three months after the end of the financial year. So waiting for that information to do one of these um, payment confirmation tests, I guess you could call it, is a really nice way to go about it. So in terms of existence and accuracy, those are the things that we can do sort of at the same time. Now, in terms of completeness, completeness is have we recorded everything? So what we're going to do here is we're also going to be thinking about this when we're auditing sales. Okay, so if we find that there are processes from sales where sales are not completely recorded, then we might have some issues here. So we could even sort of link this into the sales testing process. So
So in this one here, I've said select a haphazard sample of sales on credit and trace them through the journal entries. Because if we can see the journal entry and we don't see debit accounts receivable, then we know that there's a potential missing um, some sections of information. Now, when it comes to testing that accuracy, valuation and allocation, we've already talked about the ability to test the receipt of cash after. Um, so that, you know, there's lots of different names for this, but a post cash receipts test or a cash receipts test is something that we could use um, that I've talked about before. So we'll use a cash receipt test. You could also do some analytics depending on whether all sales are on credit or whether sales are consistently on credit. A lot of wholesalers will say, yep, all of our sales are on credit. There's no cash sales. So you might be able to do some analytical procedures there. Um, you might even do some recalculation of a sample of sales to a customer. All right, so take all the sales invoices you can find from a customer, um, add them all up, take away the payments and see if you get that same accounts receivable. Now, when it comes to rights and obligations, um, that one is a bit of a tricky one because we have to look at contracts. And really, when do we owe the right to recognize an accounts receivable when delivery is made to the customer and when we recognize those sales? So this is also going to be linked to the um, sales tests for cutoff and for classification. So there we would examine sales contracts All right, so there I've got examine a sales contract for details of when customers take ownership of goods and then confirm the accounts receivable was credited no earlier than that specific date. So that would make sure that we can only record the right when um, we have that time to be able to do it. Now, I just realized I forgot another really important test to go with the risk of material misstatements and that's bad debts. So I'm going to add it instead of presentation. I'm going to do another accuracy, valuation and allocation one in that we need to do something called an aging of accounts receivable. And that is looking at breaking up and stratifying our accounts receivable into different days overdue. So zero to 30 days for the accounts receivable, 31 to 60, 60 to 90, 90 plus. And so we're going to age our accounts receivable and evaluate overdue debts to identify all right so there I've got aging of accounts receivable and evaluate overdue debts to identify those that should be written off now we might also talk to management about their bad debt expense um, show me the bad debts that have been written off um, and sometimes they will be really proactive in this but 99% of times clients don't even think about writing off bad debts because they don't want the expense they want to try and hold it into the accounts receivable as long as possible so this might also involve talking to the person that manages accounts receivable how do you chase up debts how often how do you know when something needs to be written off and let's look at their bad debt expense write-offs compared to what we think should be written off through the aging of accounts receivable. Also, when you want to, if you're investigating bad debt expense, you know, you want to look at those or, or the provision for doubtful debts, you want to probably focus your sampling on the debts that are the most overdue. So you might look a little bit at the uh, transactions that are in zero to 30 days, but really those sales that were made that are 90 or plus days overdue, that's where you're going to find things that need to go into the provision or need to be written off as a bad debt. So now let's look at some examples for cash. Cash is really important because it's the lifeblood of the organization. You can make a profit on paper, but unless you have operating cash flow, you're in really big trouble. And when looking at cash, 
I always like to look at operating cash flow as a ratio first um, or, or the cash flow statement. Are we making positive cash from operations? And then we're going to need to gather some evidence. Now, this is going to be one of these unusual instances where I'm going to use one procedure to actually test all of the assertions at the same time. And that's going to be, I'm going to request a bank confirmation. So request or order a bank confirmation. And that's going to be the procedure we're going to use for everything except presentation and disclosure. And you might think, what? How is there one process um, and bank confirmations come out of 505 for external confirmations? Um, but how does one process meet all of the assertions? And when you write to a bank, think about a bank. A bank is pretty big. It has lots of internal controls. Its internal controls have to be checked and they've got a lot of government oversight. So we assume that bank internal controls are really strong and they're, they're capturing the right data. If there's an issue between the client books and the bank statement, you always assume that the bank statement is correct unless there's indications for otherwise. So the bank confirmation is going to tell us which accounts that the bank, uh, the company has with the bank. So here are all the list of the accounts. It's going to give us the balance for all of those accounts. So the accuracy, valuation and allocation information. It's going to tell us who owns the account. Um, and remember, the bank uh, confirmation also gives us all of the transactions. So sometimes you can ask for just the balance. Sometimes you can request also transactions um, or request statements, which will help us make sure that the process is complete. So the first thing we do is request that bank confirmation. The other thing that we're going to do, especially when it comes to completeness, because this particular process is a completeness test more than anything else, is we will, let me do this in a different color, inspect a sample of bank reconciliations. Now, if you don't remember how to do a bank reconciliation um, and you're going to a graduate job, please know how to do that. That is the number one thing that graduate employers tell me that grads can't do, which is do a bank reconciliation or understand how to do one. If you need to refresh, I'll put a video down in the uh, extra learning materials there. But inspect a sample of bank reconciliations. You might even decide, depending on the risk, to re-perform a haphazard sample of bank recs. And that means you get the client documentation, you get the, you know, the journals that they would have used, you get the bank statement. Um, I'd probably get the bank statement independently, so rather than get the client's version of the bank statement, which could have been you know, subjected to Photoshop or adjustment, get a copy direct from the bank and re-perform the bank reconciliation and make sure it matches. When we're testing bank recs as an internal control, I'm checking that number one, the bank rec was done, and number two, that the person who's supposed to approve the bank rec is doing it. When I'm testing a bank rec substantively, I'm going into the bank rec and I'm looking at detailed, does this line match up, tick, 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 and doing those, you know, preparing what would be the adjustment journals for a bank rec myself. So with cash, there's actually, you know, it looks like there might not be a lot to do, but if you're also testing accounts receivable and sales, and therefore you're looking at um, the cash side of those transactions, and if you're testing purchases and you're looking at cash disbursements, then you're also, all of that information feeds into whoever is auditing cash. And that's why most times when you start on an audit, you start auditing two things, sales, at accounts receivable, and cash. Um, because that's sort of the foundation of the firm. And then whoever audits cash also needs to make sure they're talking to the accounts receivable people, the capital works people, property plant and equipment people as well. So what about sampling and substantive testing? Do I even need to sample? Well, the answer is yes. There are way too many transactions at Woolworths, for example, to do some sampling. Um, the only time in which I would collect no sample and I would look at every single transaction is if it's a one-off, very large transaction, like the approval to build UTS Central, for example. I would have looked at that substantively um, and just looked at everything in that process because it's so large. 
But in terms of sampling for different types of audit tests, I just wanted to highlight here that when I'm testing internal controls, I want to make sure controls are operating over the entire year. When I'm testing a balance, so I'm testing accounts receivable, I want to make sure that the balance just at the year end is correct, not the balance throughout the whole year as it fluctuates. When I'm looking at transactions, I want to make sure that I'm gathering samples for transactions over the entire year, all right? Not just the end of the year or two months, over the entire year. And when I'm doing analytical procedures, there is no sampling. Now, why is there no sampling when I'm doing an analytic? Because I'm gathering all the data. I'm taking all the data and I'm, I'm aggregating it and then I'm splitting it and I'm splicing it to run comparisons. So when I'm doing these different tests in analytics, no sampling, but for a balance only at the end of the year, because that's all we've got to work with. But with transactions and controls, I want to make sure that that sample is over the whole year. So that's really important, regardless of whether I'm using, um, you know, for tests of controls, I, I might still need to select a haphazard sample over the entire year. When I'm testing transactions, it's going to also defend, depend on the assertion that I'm testing, and we'll have a slide about that coming up. So which sampling method should I use and should I write in my designs of my audit procedures? Well, the most commonly used method is haphazard. That is the human attempt at sampling randomly. You just get a box or you get all the documents and you're like just picking documents out of the box. So that's the most commonly used method. And in terms of sampling, as I mentioned before with controls testing, firms seem to have numbers like 25, 50, 150 uh, in terms of how many you'd need to select. Random is slightly coming back um, with more robotic process automation and automated testing. We're starting to see larger sample sizes. Why are larger sample sizes better? Well, the bigger the sample, then hopefully the more representative that sample is and the more accurate the information you're getting. How are audit firms handling um, trying to have increasingly large samples? One of the ways that they're actually doing that is through offshore processing. What does that mean? Instead of getting a graduate to look through 50 invoices for the same price, they will get someone in India or the Philippines to look through 500 invoices for the same amount of money because the cost of labor is much cheaper. And it's really just doing a task. Um, those offshoring process centers may not be making judgments, they're just doing the mechanics of the testing. Um, and I expect to see that in the future, a lot of offshore processing will still continue, um, but we'll also expect to see more automation, that if all the invoices look the same, you can actually use smart robotic process automation to help do some of that testing. Now, in terms of um, the most appropriate for testing over the entire year, well, again, you want to use either haphazard, uh, did I spell that correctly? Yes, random, or one of the interval options. And remember interval options are based, there is um, like in every 50th transaction, but then there's also the monetary unit sampling. So every 10,000th dollar, you collect your sample over the whole year. Now when it comes to testing the cutoff assertion, well the cutoff assertion is concentrated around just the end of the financial year. So the sampling method we want to use there is block. All right, transactions just around a specific point in time. Now, the block might be really big. If I looked at sales one to two days on either side for Woolworths, that's still millions of transactions. So what am I going to do there? Within the block, I could use the block to stratify. So I'd say, okay, I'm going to select this period, and then I might still haphazardly or randomly sample within that block. So it depends on the number of transactions that you might have. So that takes me to the next one. When you want to treat or investigate different subgroups differently, we want to stratify. And we tend to use stratification more when we're looking at substantive testing than we ever do when we're looking at controls testing. And I'll explain why in just a moment. So let's look at stratified sampling. Stratification. Uh, the little blurb here is the process of dividing the population into a series of subgroups, which are then treated separately in terms of sampling method. And typically there's got to be some characteristic 
here. And when we're looking at subgroups around accounts receivable, we're really stratifying based on risk of non-payment. Right. So if you think about which of these three sets of four sets of days, 0 to 30, 31 to 60, 61 to 90, or 91 plus, which of those has the greatest risk of being um, of, of non-payment? What do you think? If you said it's this one, you're absolutely correct. So here we might judgmentally look at all of the items in that particular period. We might then haphazardly select from a couple of others and then we might use again our judgment to look at perhaps in the 61 to 90 days the biggest customers. Um, so you know you might only look at perhaps two customers from here, you might look at if there were 10 customers here, you might look at six out of 10 customers, and then you might look at all of the customers in that other in that other section. So stratification is not a sampling method. It's just a process of dividing. And then once in those sub pools, then we do our own, we, we make a choice on what sampling method we're going to use for that particular subgroup, depending on the risk and what we're trying to achieve. Now, ASA 530 has some really great tables in Appendix 3 about when we want to collect more or less evidence. And this is really important because I'm not asking you to collect sample sizes, but based on what we might find in our outcomes or our evidence, we might need to change our sample sizes. So let's look at the first one. So number one here says, I'm going to increase my sample size where I think that there's higher ROMs, bigger, more ROMs, bigger risk. We're going to increase the sample size to see if we can find more. Number two, if I'm going to use other substantive procedures, then I'm actually going to go and I'm going to collect less evidence in this one test because I'm gathering tests and evidence from other places. Number three, if I want to have more assurance, I'm going to collect more evidence. Right, that, that, that makes total sense there. Now, the next one is interesting. Tolerable misstatement. Tolerable misstatement is essentially the materiality for the account. All right. So if materiality goes up, our sample size goes down because we're less interested in finding issues. Similarly, if the tolerable misstatement, if the tolerable misstatement decreased, then my sample size would need to increase. OK, now, again, these two are sort of linked. Five and one are linked to each other. If there's an increase in the amount of error or misstatement we expect to find, we're going to have a bigger sample size. And one and five are essentially saying pretty similar things. Um, if I'm going to stratify the population, then I might decrease my overall sample sizes, but be, be more specific. And then number seven, this one often just confuses the crap out of students. If I increase the number of sampling units in the population, if I go from 1 million transactions to 2 million transactions, then it actually has no effect on sample size. And you might think, but how does that work? In statistical sampling, once sample sizes or once the population gets to a certain capacity, I guess, increasing the sample size doesn't tend to have, you know, increasing the population size only results in maybe two or three or four more transactions being tested. However, when populations are small, if you went from 50 transactions to 100 transactions for an account, then you wouldn't necessarily double the sample size, but I'd increase it by a reasonable proportion. So that negligible effect is only for when samples are really, really large. Think of publicly listed companies. It, it tends to not make too much difference. So in terms of executing substantive tests, I'm actually not going to cover that in any of these learning videos, we are going to do this in that follow along style in our workshop because doing as I'm explaining is probably the best way to do that. So make sure that you either watch the workshop recording or come along to the workshop to make sure that you cover this particular component. So once you've collected your evidence, what do you need to do as your next steps? We need to evaluate and then make some conclusions. So let's go into our ASAs. And who can remember what ASA talks about audit sampling? Anyone remember? ASA 530 
Oops, and I can't even write 5.30 there. I went to write another number. Says that I need to do some things related to what I find. And the first one is that auditors shall investigate the nature and cause of any deviations or misstatements. You remember with controls, I said, we want to find out what's wrong. What is causing this? Because if it's something that's a one-off, well, it's going to cause one misstatement. That's something that's easy. But we need to evaluate the possible effect on, um, on other areas of the audit and that particular account. So if we have an anomaly, so remember I said the one-off, so if we've discovered uh, something that's an anomaly, then we want to make sure that it is not representative of the population. We want to check whether there are more of these same issues. I need to do, and it says here, I should perform additional audit procedures. So I just don't stop at one sample. If I find something, then I'm going to need to go and select another sample and see if the same issue crops up. If it does, then I know that I've got a potentially larger issue that might be appearing in certain transactions for certain accounts, for certain people doing the processing, perhaps if they've made a mistake in doing a particular process, then I can help actually target more audit testing to be really certain about what that dollar value misstatement is. But the key is that the audit evidence helps us ask more questions. It helps us go, what's the cause? What's happening here? Where do I find out? who is doing what or what is the issue. Because we need to try and get to the root of what is causing the misstatement so that we can also suggest to the client at the end, look, you have this problem. This person isn't trained. They keep making mistakes. Every transaction they do is just garbage. That'll help us also in, previous, in future years because we know that that error isn't going to occur again. So I have to ask myself, after I've done all this evidence, I've collected information, I think I've found what's going on, is the misstatement material? Now remember, materiality is that amount where we think that shareholders are going to make a different decision. So how do I figure out whether the four errors or the five errors I've found are material? Well, I shall project misstatements found in the sample to the population. So I test a small number of transactions and then I'm going to say, okay, Based on 10 transactions, I found an error of 2%. Therefore, over the entire population, what does that 2% error come out to be? So we're going to do some examples of how to do that. And of course, if, you're, if what you found or what you projected is higher than materiality, you have a material misstatement that you're going to need to ask the client to make an adjustment for. If it's lower, then your projection is lower, then there's nothing to worry about there. So here's the evaluation process. We start by finding, oops, let me get a pen that's actually one that you can see. You start by finding what are the errors. Then we have to figure out what's the tolerable level of misstatement. This is really materiality for that specific account. It might be the same as materiality for the entire set of financials. It might be smaller because the account is smaller. It might even be lower again because there's increased risk on that particular account compared to other accounts. So the more risk, remember, the lower the level of tolerable misstatement or the materiality for the account. I go away and I conduct my tests and then we're going to do this process of projection and evaluation. Now, I'm just using my phone here as the calculator. In your exam, you should use a proper like calculator calculator, just in case any remote AI invigilation software sees you holding your phone and goes, oh, you're doing the wrong thing. So calculate, though a lot of calculators look like phones as well, so I don't know how the system actually tells whether you're using a calculator or whether you're using a phone. So let's look at an example. I've got misstatements in my sample of 250,000, my value of my sample and my value of the population. Okay, so here, what I need to do is I need to take my misstatements in my sample, 250,000, divided by the value of my sample. I got the right number of zeros in there, no, 2 million. And then I multiply that by my 5 million. Okay. So 250,000 divided by 2 million gives me. 12.5% of error in the account, which is pretty high, all right? So that ends up being 12.5%. Then I multiply that by my 5 million. 
and I get an error projected misstatement of $625,000 is the projected misstatement, okay? So the question I have to ask myself is, is this material? So I'm going to do this with two particular circumstances. So let's go with scenario one. One. So if scenario one, if the uh, tolerable level is 600,000 versus I'll have scenario two, where the tolerable level is 650,000, which is still, this is a ridiculously high number, but um, if in scenario one, my 600,000 compared to my 625, it's above the tolerable misstatement. So 625 is bigger. So there we're going to say material misstatement. All right. On the other side, if we had 650, well, 625 is lower. So here we would say no misstatement, all right, or no material misstatement, because we still do have a misstatement. But the question we need to do is we need to say, what is causing this $250,000 worth of error? That number of 12.5% of error within an account, you know, regardless of what the tolerable level is, that would be a warning bell to me. So that's more than 10% of the account misstated. So what would I do here in real life, right? I've got a projection that's pretty big. In real life, I would go and I would select another sample. Let's test the sample and does that same rate of 12.5% come back in my second sample or does it disappear? Dig into those individual um, causes. So $250,000 is probably, you know, 10 or five misstatements. What causes each of those? Could there be a control weakness? How do I select a sample that might help me target and find those specific issues? to actually go and do more investigation because a client will not make an adjustment based on a projection just like this. They'll say, show me more proof, test more transactions, gather more evidence to convince me. Because remember, I can't ask management to change the financial statements. I can request it, but they have to do it themselves. So let's look at a more complex example when it comes to stratification. Now, a mistake that a lot of students do is they'll take the total value of the sample total value of the population, and then just do one projection. But here we need to do it individually. So I found $2,000 worth of error in $100,000 worth of sample, that's 2%, and the population is 850,000. So for that first one, I found $17,000 worth of projected error. In the second one, 4,500 divided by 85,000, multiplied by 450,000 gives me ugh, a number with decimal places. Let's just round up to the nearest dollar here. Two, three, eight, two, four. And then 3,000 divided by 100,000 times by 100,000. All right, now in that one, what do you notice? You might notice here that I've tested the entire population, so I don't need to actually do the projection there, silly me. So let's add all these up. 17,000, whoops, not 170,000, plus 23,824, plus 3,000. All right, my total projected misstatement is 43,824. Now, as a comparison, let's do it the other way, all right? If we do it the other way, we have, oops, I'm doing the wrong thing, 2,000 plus 4,500 plus 3,000 gives me, if I added all these up, oh, let's do it in a different color pen so it's more easy to see, I'd have $9,500 worth of error out of $285,000 worth of sample multiplied by uh, 850, 950, 1 okay. All right, and let's work out what that is as a comparison. 285 times 1.4 million. All right, 
So that gives me 46667. Now, you might notice here there's a difference of about $3,000, um, and it's giving us a much higher projection than if we have the individual stratification. So if you get a stratified example, you should calculate it based on the individual strata rather than adding them all up like I did on the right. So always do it individually. So to sum up, number one, use your knowledge of the client, inherent risk, significant risk, control risk to determine what assertions are at greater risk and that you need to gather evidence on. The more risk, if you have one assertion that's way higher risk than everything else, you might even consider doing two audit procedures. Remember how to apply the four design rules, okay? Um, I'm going to give you some more examples to practice on, but the only way to get good at this is to practice. Um, and make sure that you come to our workshop to cover the follow-along examples so that you know how to do the actual testing as well. Thanks very much for watching. That's the end of our module on gathering evidence. Um, and our next module is going to cover the last uh, technology. And then uh, the last module is going to be what we do with all this evidence and finishing up the audit.